Yes, you're right. It's the hour of the time, and I'm William Cooper. Uh, tonight, I'm going to be going through information at about 5,000 miles an hour, so you better have pen and paper ready. But first, I want to thank some special people for all the help that they gave us last week <coughs> in making the conference possible and successful. First, my good friend Tim Lesbrantz of Surplus and Stuff, Dead Eye, John Gill, and Rosalie. Uh, thank you very much. Jimbo, uh, the cook at Katie's Country Kitchen, who, by the way, cooked on uh, Friday night at the camp out, along with a whole lot of other people. Catherine and Ferris and uh, Scott. Everybody. We could not have done it without you. Lenny, Ray, all of you. Carolyn, Annie, Little Pooh, and Nathan. And uh, I'm sure that when time comes around to do this again, We'll have just as good a help from all these people and maybe many more. Now, I have to apologize to everybody who was here who left Saturday morning after a big breakfast at Katie's Country Kitchen. We were all sitting there around the tables, and when I finished my breakfast, I got up and walked out the door and left. Annie, of course, went around and said goodbye to everybody. I couldn't do that, folks, and I'm not going to tell you why. I just couldn't do it. To me, it wasn't goodbye, and I don't consider you gone. And I think if I'd have gone around table to table and done what maybe was expected of me, I probably would have made a fool of myself right there in front of everybody. So I chose just to leave, and uh, like I said... To me, it wasn't goodbye. It's not goodbye. You came here for a reason. We brought you here for a reason. I think we all realized the purpose of the week. I'm extremely proud of every one of you. And I know that I'll see you all again sometime in the future. You're all such good people. If it's not in this life, I know that it'll be in the next.
sure could use him. Before I get into tonight's content of this broadcast, I'm going to clear a couple of things up. People keep calling me and asking me what I'm going to do about the arrest of Jack McClam in Phoenix. And the answer is nothing. He broke the law. And he knows better than this. He's milking you for a legal defense fund for an offense that is really not very serious and doesn't require a legal defense fund. And he knows and has always known that wearing the officer, the uniform of a police officer, even if you are a police officer when you're not on duty, is against the law. He's a retired police officer from the Phoenix Police Force. The law says whether he's retired or not, if he's not actively on duty, or it's not one of the national holidays where wearing one's uniform is considered to be okay, that it is against the law. Jack McClam knows it. You, the sheeple, don't know it. And you're all forking your money out into a legal defense fund that you have no business putting your money into to begin with. Greitz does the same thing. He claims that he resigned his commission from the United States Army, yet he wears his uniform all over the country, dripping with what we call Gita medals. It's against the law, ladies and gentlemen. They do it because they can net the sheeple who look up to the uniform and the authority figure, and you think that because they wear that uniform, they're automatically telling you the truth. Now, I made a bet when Greitz went on radio and took Tom Donahue's place. I made a bet that he wouldn't last two weeks because he wasn't talking to the sheeple on shortwave radio. He was talking to people who have had a good grounding in what's going on, a good education. The people who listen to this program and others are not sheeple. They're not stupid. After a week of phone calls from people asking intelligent questions, Greitz called it quits, which I knew he would. And I won my bet. And now I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to bet the same bet on Jack McClam. Well, he's not as, as quick to anger as Greitz is, so he may last a month. But I'll give him no more than that. Because you, the intelligent listening audience, will very quickly see through all these people that tell you that they're going to take care of things and you don't have to worry about anything because they're there to protect you. <laughs> and when you start asking them intelligent questions and they give you the wrong answers, you're going to start making some comments and... Uh, asking some more questions, and pretty soon it's going to be obvious to you who's who and what's what. You see, these people are used to talking to sheeple. They're not used to the audience, as they now have. And I'm sure that you all understand it. Now, one more thing. You keep calling and asking me about Mark from Michigan, and I've told you several times. Mark from Michigan does not pan out when you ask for documentation. He's been trying to feed me bullshit for years. For years, ladies and gentlemen. It started back when Stan was with me. The first few times he called Stan, he said that he was an intelligence officer in the United States Air Force. Stan began to get his information and give it to me, and I asked Stan to ask the guy to give us some documentation, which he said that he had and would furnish and never has. And that's been, oh gosh, I think he first contacted us in 1991. He still has not furnished us with any documentation. He has stated that he was a member of the 40th Ranger Battalion. He first told us he was in Air Force Intelligence. If he was a member of the 40th Ranger Battalion, that's United States Army, and does not exist. <laughs> and did not exist during the time that he says that he was in the United States Army. There are no Belgian troops in the United States in the, in the numbers of thousands, like he says there are, and many, many other things. 
that you, the sheeple, had better start paying attention and checking things out. You're making a big mistake. And yes, some of the things he says are the truth. Garnered from other people, from books like mine, and embellished with his own particular brand of fantasy. Linda Thompson lives in Indianapolis, and she got to know Mark from Michigan. And I warned her about him. He is the one who came up with the idea of an armed militia march in Washington, D.C. Linda picked it up and ran with it. And everybody attacked her. The culprit, really, if you want to know who the culprit is, is Mark from Michigan. Wake up, sheeple. This man is not who he says he is. Never has been. We've never bit on his BS, nor do we intend to. He is, in fact, an employee of a university in Michigan. And he works for the housing that takes care, or he works for the department, I should say, that takes care of student housing. From the Circle, Minneapolis, June 1994, by Jeff Armstrong. Minneapolis police held a bedridden 66-year-old Anishinaabe woman, her disabled son, and a Chicano neighbor at gunpoint while they ransacked the woman's house in a fruitless search for narcotics. The June 23rd raid on June Tibbetts' South Minneapolis home by 3rd Precinct crack unit officers armed with handguns a shotgun, shield, and battering ram came up empty in the search for drugs, succeeding only in terrifying the Leech Lake woman whose lung condition requires a constant supply of oxygen. Quote, they just walked into my house and pointed their guns at me and told me not to move. And I said, I can't move, said Tibbetts. End quote. Tibbetts' son, Frank, who can barely walk as a result of a hit-and-run car accident and her neighbor, Jesus, Chaboya, recently released from the hospital for skin cancer-related surgery, were ordered to lie face down on the floor, handcuffed and held at gunpoint while officers executed a search warrant for cocaine. They held guns on us like they wanted us to do something so they could shoot us. That's how I felt, how frightened I was, said Tibbetts. She said her young grandchildren were woken up from their nap, frisk and threatened with handcuffing if they moved. Tibbetts said the officers looked with suspicion on the oxygen tank, which has become her lifeline. I had a portable tank next to my bed. I thought they were going to kick it over. According to Tibbetts, one officer went so far as to dump out a medicine bundle containing items blessed by a midwind spiritual leader. They didn't have no respect for anything when they came in, she said. According to a warrant left after the raid, the operation was initiated by Officer Caspers who requested and obtained permission from a judge to search the premises for narcotic drugs and controlled substances, including but not limited to cocaine. Tibbetts said police told her she was a suspect because of the frequent visitors which passed through her open doors. Police told her she was a suspect because of the frequent visitors which passed through her open doors. Police told her she was a suspect because of the frequent visitors which passed through her open doors. Those are just my Indian friends that come over to check up on me, Tibbet said. As to cocaine, she says, I don't even know what the darn stuff looks like. Apparently, the police came to much the same conclusion after the search, which was less extensive than is usually the case, causing no serious damage to the Ojibwe elders' belongings. My son heard them laughing and saying, I guess we got the wrong house, said Tibbetts. They thought it was funny. But no apologies were forthcoming from the department or the officers involved in the incident, which Tibbetts said was affected her mental and physical well-being. I haven't been able to sleep since then. I keep thinking about that gun, said Tibbetts, who mentioned that her fear has made breathing more problematic. You don't think there's a police state in the United States of America? You don't think these scumbags who call themselves police officers or a little Gestapo? Can you imagine breaking into an old woman's house who's on oxygen, sick, just because people come in and out of her home checking on her? 
searching everybody, scaring everybody, pointing guns up their nose. And they laugh about it. Don't even feel sorry that they did it. No apologies. You don't think we're in trouble? You better think again. You better think again real hard. This is from, from uh, Frontiers of Science, titled Ammunition, page 113. Where's the date? Uh, da -da 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 -da. Frontiers of Science, volume 1. The New Illustrated Science and Invention Encyclopedia. H.S. Stutzman, Publishers, Westport, Connecticut, 06889. It's from page 113, Ammunition. The future of chemical weapons is closely linked with genetic developments, and there are suggestions that agents could be developed which would attack certain ethnic groups, since they would be the only people with the correct genetic characteristics to be vulnerable in the battlefield. They would quickly be exterminated. In a frightening scenario, the genetically tailored device could be employed covertly by one nation against another to attack a whole male generation and destroy that nation's social system. Are you listening? Reno wants to expand asset seizure. Arizona Republic, Sunday, June the 5th, 1994. Section L1. Suppose for the fun of it that the police suspected your teenage son of selling pot out of his home, in effect your home, and therefore seized your house, automobile, fishing boat, and other assets including bank accounts under the federal government's interesting asset forfeiture laws. You protest vigorously. How are you supposed to know? You aren't a party to your son's business sideline, if any. Besides, the boy swears he's innocent, and you're not at all convinced that the government has much of a case against him. Unfortunately for you, the government doesn't have to have a case. It may never even bring your son to trial, or even press charges. All your assets can be seized, confiscated, sold at auction, and there's nothing that you can do. You cannot get them back. Without a trial, without due process, without being convicted of any crime, this is happening in America today, and Janet Reno wants to expand asset seizure. Attention Americans. America first. Freedom forever. New world order. Never. Come one, come all to the U.S. Constitution Restoration Rally at the Lakeland, Florida Civic Center. 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. Saturday, October the 1st, 1994. Saturday, October the 1st, 1994. Plan to be there. Now, I'm going to go through this. Featured speakers include Mark Cornkey. Mark Cornkey. Remember my admonition. Listen to everyone. Read everything. Believe nothing unless you can prove it in your own right. Stop believing that everybody that says they are what they are are really what they are. Check it out. Stop believing what they say blindly. Check it out. Larry Pratt. He's the executive director of, director of Gun Owners of America. Jeff Baker, author of Checkmate, The Game of Princes. He's also trying to convince you that the end of the world is right around the corner. The end of the world is not right around the corner. He's also telling you Jesus is coming soon. I'm telling you Jesus is not coming soon simply because he's telling you that he is. Read your Bibles. Red Beckman. Make sure you listen to Red. Michael Bin. You know, he was on my show not too long ago. At that time, he claimed he had 12 million petition signatures to impeach Clinton. He now claims he has 17 million petition signatures to impeach Clinton. Nobody's seen those signatures. And I say that between the time he was on my show and right now, he could not possibly have obtained that many signatures. There's no petitions out there anywhere. I don't think Michael Ben is on the level, folks. And I think you better be very cautious where he's concerned. There'll be seminars conducted by Dr. James Wardner, Jerry Hughes, Pastor Richard Mooneyhan, Representative James Kerrigan. If he's a politician, he's a traitor. Ron Adams, Betty Mills. Betty Mills is a good woman. Mark Clark and others. 
Some of these people I don't know anything about. Be careful. Listen to everyone. Believe nothing. But go. There's some people there you need to listen to. There's some other people there you also need to listen to, if you know what I mean. Monday, July 18th, 1994, USA Today. Media elite meet at Idaho retreat. You don't think the media is controlled. You don't think that they operate in conjunction with each other. Why is it that on any given day, on all of the different channels, network that is, you hear the same news, worded exactly the same way? Why is it in all the newspapers across this country, except small independent, small town newspapers, you read the same stories, worded the same way, with the same political slant? Media elite meet at Idaho retreat. Sun Valley Gathering draws Comcast, CBS, QVC, Chiefs, and many others. FBI powers expanded in North Dakota. News Digest. July 7th, 1989. I believe. I believe that's the date. Let me make sure. Nope. March 4th, 1994. March 4th, 1994. FBI powers expanded in North Dakota. FBI agents may now make arrests in North Dakota for violations of state law. You don't think the federal government is taking over? You don't think there's a police state in America? FBI agents may now make arrests in North Dakota for violations of state law? Wake up, sheeple. Governor Ed Schaefer signed the bill into law on March 23, 1993. It is now taking effect not just in North Dakota, but all across the United States. In Minnesota, Declaration of World Citizenship. Whereas in recognition of the greatly increased interdependence of the world in this age of nuclear power, pollution, hunger, and whereas realizing that the common interest of man can only be met through world cooperation, and whereas seeking to free mankind from the curse of war and to harness all available sources of energy and knowledge to the service of man's needs, and whereas aware that we can best serve our city, county, state, and nation when we also think and act as world citizens, now therefore be it resolved that we, the governor and legislative leaders of Minnesota, recognize the sovereign right of our citizens to declare that their citizenship responsibilities extend upon beyond our state and nation. We hereby join with other concerned people of the world in a declaration that we share in this world responsibility and that our citizens are in this sense citizens of the world. We pledge our efforts as world citizens to the establishment of permanent peace based on just world law and to the use of world resources in the service of man and not for his destruction. Be it further resolved that as a symbol of our obligations as world citizens, we proudly display the United Nations flag with the United States flag at the main entrance to the state capitol and urge other states to do the same effective March 26th. Listen carefully, sheeple. 1971. May, March. Excuse me. March 26th, 1971. Signed, Wendell R. Anderson, Governor, State of Minnesota. Official definition. Democracy versus Republic. And this was prepared under the direction of the Chief of Staff. It's a training manual. The War Department, Washington, November 30th, 1928. Democracy, a government of the masses, authority derived through mass meeting or any other form of direct expression, results in mobocracy. Attitude toward property is communistic, negating property rights. Attitude toward law is that the will of the majority shall regulate whether it be based upon deliberation or governed by passion, prejudice, and impulse without restraint or regard to consequences. Results in demagogism, license, agitation, discontent, anarchy. A republic. A republic. Authority is derived through the election by the people of public officials best fitted to represent them. Attitude toward property is respect for laws and individual rights and a sensible economic procedure. Attitude toward law is the administration of justice in accord with fixed principles and established evidence with a strict regard to consequences. A greater number of citizens and extent of territory may be brought within its compass. 
avoids the dangerous extreme of either tyranny or mobocracy. Results in statesmanship, liberty, reason, justice, contentment, and progress as the standard form of government throughout the world. A republic is a form of government under a constitution which provides for the election of one, an executive, and two, a legislative body, when working together in a representative capacity, have all the power of appointment, all power of legislation, all power to raise revenue and appropriate expenditures, and are required to create three, a judiciary to pass upon the justice and legality of their governmental acts and to recognize for certain inherent individual rights. I've been telling you for years, democracy is a code word for socialism, Marxism, results in dictatorship. Ranchers fear new grazing plan. Ranchers' grazing plan could spark range war. Cattlemen suspicious of new rules and fees. Folks, this is from Sunday, August 7th, 1994, the Arizona Republic. The ranchers in Arizona are angry. They are meeting shortly. They have invited federal, state, and local officials to meet with them in an effort to reach some kind of agreement to stave off violence. And I know some of these people. Washington, D.C. had better start listening. Democrats opposed to assault, gun ban, delay, final action on crime bill, Friday. Fifth, August, 1994, Arizona Republic. See, the Friday the 5th or Saturday the 6th of August, 1994, Arizona Republic. They're staving off the gun bill. In other words, there are some Democrats who are beginning to understand that the population of this country are serious about their rights protected by the second article and amendment. And they're getting scared. They're backing away. They're beginning to listen. You need to start calling. Call your congressmen. Call your senators. Call, 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 call. Don't stop calling. Keep calling. Call, call. Don't ever stop hoping that politics will work. We must exercise every avenue that we have right up until the end. Tell them we do not want the crime bill passed. We want no restrictions on the right of the people to keep and bear arms. No restrictions on the right of the people to form and belong to militias. Do it. Don't sit there don't scratch your head. Don't wonder if you should do it. Just do it. We only have one rule in my family, folks, and this is that rule. Whenever you're confronted with a decision, pick the right decision. And you all know what's right and wrong. Pick the right decision. Trust in God and just do it. Just do it. No excuses, no whimpering, no crying, no slacking. Just do it. If you fly in from Birmingham, you'll get the last gate. If you flew in from Boston, no, you sure won't have to wait. And I'm learning a little more every day. About the power of the dollar and the people with white collars and the good old American way. I've noticed I don't get much help when they see my blue jeans. Some place where the suit walks up, oh, can I help you please? Cause I'm learning. As I gain a little age. Oh, my with white collars and the good old American way.
The Hour of the Time is brought to you by Swiss America Trading, folks. They specialize in non-reportable, non-confiscatable hard assets, precious metals in their various forms. These you're going to need in the coming months and years. The dollar continues to lose value. I just read another warning in the newspaper about coming inflation. Coming. My foot has been here forever. It's never quit. Hasn't quit, folks. Every day that you hold on to those counterfeit Federal Reserve fraud notes in your pocket, you lose. You lose. You continually lose. And you don't understand about dollars and gold. You'll notice when the value of the dollar goes up, the value of gold goes down and vice versa. But you'll also notice that the value of gold started out a long, long time ago. long, long time ago. Way, way down there. One ounce of gold was worth $20. That's right, folks. One ounce of gold used to be worth $20. A $20 gold pay piece weighed one ounce. One ounce, ladies and gentlemen. Now, how much is an ounce of gold? What will it buy compared to $20 paper money? Now, if you can't figure that out, then I can't help you. You see, the value of paper continues and will always continue to decline because it's a method of theft, of stealing. The value of gold, on the other hand, maintains its value. You see, with one ounce of gold today, which today, I believe the market closed around $377 or $78 an ounce for gold, that one ounce of gold today worth $378 will buy exactly the same thing that a $20 gold piece would buy in the last century. And some of you still don't understand, do you? Those that do, call Swiss America Trading right now, 1-800-289-2646. That's 1-800-289-2646. Four, six. Do it now. You'll be glad that you did. 1-800-289-2646. Take a great weight off your shoulders, folks. Protect your assets. Do it. It's the end of time And the Mississippi River She's a gold grind The interest is up And the stock market's down And you're only getting mugged If you go downtown I live back in the woods, you see My woman and the kids And the dogs and me Got a shotgun, a rifle, and a four-wheel drive, and a country boy can survive. Country folks can survive. I can plow a field all day long. I can catch catfish from dusk till dawn. Make our own whiskey and our own boat too. Amendment 1 to the Constitution of the United States of America is the first of the first ten amendments known as the Bill of Rights. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. All of these have been thrown in the trash can. You say no. You say they're making separation of church and state. Not so, folks. Not so. I'm going to read to you something. 
Public Law 102-12, H.J., House Joint Resolution 104, March 20th, 1991, Education Day, United States of America, Proclamation, Joint Resolution, designated March 26, 1991, as Education Day, USA. Whereas Congress recognizes the historical tradition of ethical values and principles which are the basis of civilized society and upon which our great nation was founded. Whereas these ethical values and principles have been the bedrock of society from the dawn of civilization, when they were known as the seven Noahide laws. Whereas without these ethical values and principles, the edifice of civilization stands in serious peril of returning to chaos. Whereas society is profoundly concerned with the recent weakening of these principles that has resulted in crises that beleaguer and threaten the fabric of civilized society. Whereas the justified preoccupation with these crises must not let the citizens of this nation lose sight of their responsibility to transmit these historical ethical values from our distinguished past to the generations of the future. Whereas the Lubavitch movement has fostered and promoted these ethical values and principles throughout the world. Whereas Rabbi Menachem Shearson, leader of the Lubavitch movement, is universally respected and revered, and his 89th birthday falls on March 26, 1991. Whereas in tribute to this great spiritual leader, the Rebbe, this, his 19th year, 90th year, will be seen as one of education and giving, the year in which we turn to education and charity, to return the world to the moral and ethical values contained in the seven Noahide laws, and whereas this will be reflected in an international scroll of honor signed by the President of the United States and other heads of state, now therefore be it resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled that March 26, 1991, the start of the 90th year of Rabbi Menachem Shearson, leader of the worldwide Lubavitch movement, is designated as Education Day USA. The President is requested to issue a proclamation calling upon the people of the United States to observe such day with appropriate ceremonies and activities. Now, I have several comments to make about this, ladies and gentlemen. Certain racist scumbags in this country are trying to stir you up and tell you that the Jew Talmudic laws, Noahide laws for Goyim, now is U.S. public policy, and it means decapitation for Christians. Christians would be considered guilty of violating law number two, thou shalt not blaspheme God, because Christians believe that Jesus the Christ is God manifest in the flesh, and this Christian belief is blasphemy to the religion and tradition of the Jews. The Noahide laws developed by the Jews provide for their execution of every Christian on the face of the earth by means of decapitation and if you fall for this, you are a fool. For what I just read to you, Public Law 102-12 designates March 26, 1991, Education Day USA. It does not adopt as law the seven Noahide laws. And anybody who wants to can get Public Law 102-12 which was House Joint Resolution 104, dated March 20th, 1991, and read it. These people, once again, are trying to pit Jew against Christian. Now, if you're a fool, jump right in the tank. Somebody will slap you down. If you're smart, you'll get the law and read it, and realize that you're being scammed by these scumbags once again. Once again. While they pit us one against the other, they run around behind our backs, putting the chains on the ankles of all of us. White, black, Jew, Muslim, Oriental, American Indian, it doesn't matter. Racism is a plague upon mankind. And racists are the germs that infect the body human. Automatic ID News, August 1994. If chips are for pets, why not for kids? This is a large article written by Mark David, Editor-in-Chief, justifying the use of biochip implants in children because it works in the pet implant program. And yes, folks, there really is a magazine called Automatic ID News. You see, that's big business. You didn't know that, did you? Well, you do now. Because I just told you. 
Electronic Pet ID Saves Errant Pets. Automatic ID News. Volume 10, number 9, August 1994. The all-important database. The AVMA abstains and observes. An enormous market awaits. What users are still looking for. The AIM Small Animal Radio Frequency ID Task Force. Radio Frequency Tagged Salmon Catches Poacher. How did the Europeans do it? Aha. Uh -huh. That's interesting, isn't it? Droopy the Dog Test Technology. Voice and Location Tracking System. Alert Rider of Stops. You ain't heard nothing yet, folks. We just begun. Now, you heard me tell you about the Open Skies Treaty. And I still get calls from people saying, You're a liar. There's no Russian aircraft overflying the United States. And I still hear on Radio for Peace International, the lying scumbag toot toot voice of the United Nations, saying that there's no Russian aircraft flying over the United States. Yep, sheeple. Department of Defense. Defense Investigative Service, Directorate for Industrial Security, Industrial Security Letter, February 14, 1994, Item 16, Open Skies Treaty. The Defense Investigative Service, DIS, is the focal point for industrial security issues in the Defense Treaty Inspection Readiness Program, DTIRP. The DTIRP is an interagency counterintelligence and security countermeasures program responsible for conducting security vulnerability assessments for facilities subject to arms control inspection. One important goal of the DTIRP is the dissemination of information concerning arms control treaty risks to government and industry customers. This article describes the Open Skies Treaty, OST, and requests feedback from Defense Industrial Security Program contractors. The OST will allow foreign aircraft to fly over your facility with a variety of sensors, including cameras, radar, and infrared. We believe that, for most of you, the OST will not prove to be a greater threat to classified or proprietary information than already exists. For contractors who conduct sensitive outside testing or need to move sensitive hardware, the OST may be more problematic. The purpose of this article is to share information on the Open Skies Treaty and to request feedback as a means to determine how planned activities in both the United States governmental and industrial sectors might be affected by Open Skies overflights. Contractor security officials should coordinate their response through corporate channels. The information collected would also act as a starting point from which to develop a set of guidelines to assist in the preparation for overflights and to help organizations understand their specific Open Skies Treaty responsibilities. Since the success of these objectives will be largely dependent on input from the field, your cooperation in this project is requested but voluntary. The Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition is tasked with coordinating the implementation of all arms control treaties, including the OST. OST is intended to be a confidence and security building measure affecting the 27 nations who are current signatories to the agreement. The signatories include 11 East European and former Soviet states, in addition to our NATO allies, including Russia. As a result of the Open Skies Treaty, the entire territory of the United States will be the subject to short-notice overflights by the other signatory nations. During a given 96-hour period, an Open Skies observation flight may overfly as many as 4,900 kilometers of United States territory. The flight will begin as early as 72 hours after initial notification by the observing party in the initial notification, the observing party will only inform the United States of the point of origin of their flight in the United States and the total distance that will be flown. At least 16 hours prior to takeoff, the United States will know the precise route to be flown. At that time, all affected government and private sites located in the proximity of the flight path and which desire to be alerted will be informed. Are you listening, sheeple? Overflight quotas will increase as the OST ages for the period from the date of entry into force until December 31st of the following year. The United States will be subject to only four overflights by Russia, Belarusia. And this distribution was worked out during over, uh, Open Skies Treaty negotiations. That was several years ago, folks. 
Active quotas will be reviewed and negotiated annually by the Open Skies Cons Consultative Commission. During each of the two years following the initial period, assumed to be 1995 and 1996, the U.S. is obligated to accept no more than 31 overflights. That is obligated to accept. The truth is they have accepted many more than that. However, it is unlikely that this quota will be fully subscribed for planning purposes. The Department of Defense assumes the United States will receive about 15 flights each year. There have been more than 15 landings of Soviet aircraft on United States airports across this country, ladies and gentlemen, this year alone. And it's only half over. Once the Open Skies Treaty reaches the full implementation stage, three years after EIF, the United States will be obligated to accept up to 42 overflights each year. It is also currently thought that this quota will not be fully used. Ha <laughs> ha. The aircraft expected to be used during OST overflights of the U.S. will be a variant of the C-135 or a similar type foreign aircraft. And it talks about the sensors that they're allowed to carry and all of that kind of stuff. Are you listening? The rise of citizen militias. United States News and World Report. U.S. News and World Report, August 15th, 1994. Get it. August 15th, 1994. U.S. News and World Report. As a response to our formation of militias across this country. I told you, ladies and gentlemen, there is a second continental army of the Republic. Militias are forming in every state across the nation. We have scared them. You see, they would not print an article. They would not even recognize that we were doing such a thing if we were not scaring the living hell out of them. This is their answer. I'm not going to read it to you because it's long. You need to get the article. You need to get the magazine and read it for yourself. It is propaganda designed to demonize the militia in the eyes of the sheeple, just like they demonized David Koresh and the Branch Davidians. Remember what I told you about your militia organizations, how they should be formed, who you should allow and who you should not. Don't get radical. If you do, they will have grounds for their demonization and they will exploit it to the fullest. We are within the law. Militias will continue to form. We will continue to prepare, regardless of what they print in their lying Marxist rag. I are in the heart of gun country, Virginia town taken aback by arrest of alleged extremists. Now listen to this, folks. This is what is happening. We're scaring them. They're running scared. Democrats are deserting Clinton. They're backing away from the crime bill. We are becoming effective simply because the only thing that these people understand is violence. They are now becoming afraid of the population of the United States of America. In Pulaski, Virginia, they love their guns in this rural town of 12,000 in the conservative New River Valley, about 60 miles west of Roanoke. This is from the Washington Post, Sunday, July 31st, 1994. On the first day of deer hunting season in mid-November, the town's main employer, a Volvo General Motors manufacturing plant, shuts down so employees can go hunting. Some schools close as well. But while bearing arms is a lifestyle here, residents were taken aback last week by the arrest of two local men who federal authorities say are part of a group that has been stockpiling automatic weapons and explosives in preparation for an armed conflict with the government to protest laws restricting firearms. Now listen to me, you Marxist jerks. It has nothing to do with protesting laws restricting firearms. It has to do with the destruction of the United States of America, with the trashing of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, with the formation of a one-world totalitarian socialist government. You're not going to get away with it. And if you continue with your stupidity, we will fight you. And it may take us a long time, but we will win. And when we do... The traitors will be arrested. They will be tried by a jury of their peers, constitutionally, 
and if found guilty, they will be hung by the neck until dead. The Morning Call, Saturday, July 30th, 1994. Doomsday planes to get roll in disaster missions. Andrews Air Force Base, Maryland, in an effort to get more out of the military's Cold War inventory, Boeing 747s, designed to be wartime airborne command posts, will be used during natural disasters or national emergencies. To highlight that move, one of the huge jets was put on display to the media yesterday for the first time ever. This aircraft has more communications capability than any aircraft in the world, said Colonel Al Salter, chief of the four such aircraft available for the new mission. Should Washington or other military command centers be incinerated in wartime, the jet would serve as a survivable command center. That allows the nation's top civilian or military leaders a way to keep in touch with anybody left on the ground. Since chances for a nuclear Armageddon have eased with the end of the Cold War, the planes will be used for national emergencies. They talk about terrorists. They talked about the raid on the little town of Rainier, Washington to overcome terrorists. Terrorists, ladies and gentlemen, has become the code word for patriots who will resist the overthrow of the United States government and the formation of a one-world government under the United Nations. This, let me see, right to repel force by force justifiable homicide. Listen to this. Citizens may resist unlawful arrest to the point of taking and arresting officers' life if necessary. Plummer versus State, 136, Indiana, 306, 1893. This fundamental premise was upheld by the Supreme Court of the United States in the case of John Bad Elk versus United States, 177, United States Supreme Court Decision 529, 1900, when the court stated, quote, where the officer is killed in the course of the disorder which naturally accompanies an attempted arrest that is resisted, the law looks with very different eyes upon the transaction. When the officer had the right to make the arrest, from what it does if the officer had no right, what might be murder in the first case might be nothing more than manslaughter in the other, or the facts might show that no offense had been committed. An arrest made with a defective warrant or one issued without affidavit or one that fails to allege a crime is without jurisdiction and one who is being arrested may resist arrest and break away. If the arresting officer is killed by one who is so resisting, the killing will be no more than an involuntary manslaughter. Push versus the People, 75, Illinois, 491, reaffirmed and quoted in State versus Leach, 7, Connecticut, 452, State versus Gleason, 32, Kansas, 245, Ballard versus State, 43, Ohio, 340, State versus Russo, 241, P, 2nd, 447, State versus Spalding, 34, Minnesota, 3621. When a person being without fault is in a place where he has a right to be is violently assaulted, he may, without retreating, repel force by force. And if, in the reasonable exercise of his right of self-defense, his assailant is killed, he is justifiable. Runyon v. State, 57, Indiana, 80. Miller v. State, 74, Indiana, 1. These principles apply as well to an officer attempting to make an arrest who abuses his authority and transcends the bounds thereof by the use of unnecessary force and violence as they do to a private individual who unlawfully uses such force and violence. Jones v. State, 26, Texas. APP 1, Beaverts v. State, 4, Texas, APP 175. Skidmore v. State, 43, Texas, 93, number 903. Now, tell me why the defense attorneys for the Branch Davidians did not do their homework. Why did they not present the proper defense? Was it because they weren't really intended to defend those people? Because I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, I don't care what they say. I don't care what heroes you may think they are. They did not, in fact, properly defend the Branch Davidians, who are all sitting in jail, for properly exercising their right to defend themselves against an illegal attack upon their church. Good night. And God bless you all.
people. I think it's time we stop this running around. This world is going too fast and we'd like to slow it down. Don't let them talk you into doing what you don't want to. Just learn to say no and learn how to refuse. Cause you don't owe nobody nothing except God above. Go out and go after the things in life you love. Don't try to force it if it ain't going smooth. The one person that you should never try to fool you. You can make it to the top, but only you'll know when to reach. And I am not just talking cause I practice what I preach. Maybe you don't do all the things you're supposed to. Your boss gives you a job you hate and you smile, that's the rule. You see yourself playing the game and it's rubbing you wrong. Oh, you don't know how much more you'll take. How long can it go on? Well, you don't know nobody, nothing except God above. Go out and go after the things in life you love. Don't try to force it if it ain't going. One person that you should never try to fool is you. You can make it to the top, but only you'll know when to reach. And I am not just talking, I practice what I preach. No, I am not just talking, cause I practice what I preach.